change. Come on. What a mighty God. We said better. Come on. to talk about today was an issue to deal with families because we all know the families is the bedrock of any society Amen. but more than that as well if it's the bedrock of a society it's the bedrock of a church Amen. and we as a church value our families and so I thought it would be good to spend a little, little bit of time talking about families and some of the things that we can help our families in godly ways. So I'm just wondering if we can change the, the PowerPoint to computer number two and so I can get the PowerPoint presentation up. Let's just, while that happens, bow our heads as we, we pray. Oh, kind, loving Heavenly Father, I just want to pray at this time that your spiritual lead May your words be heard today, and may our hearts be touched and our minds be illuminated, and that we may be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would it surprise you to know that a, a successful couple compared with an let's say, an unsuccessful couple, do not, they do not argue any significantly less. They argue about the same, same amount. So let me put it, say it another way. A couple that is considered successful, have a good marriage, have a good relationship, do not argue or have disagreements any less than a family who is considered unsuccessful. Would that surprise you? Yes. No, some say yes, some say no. The, the thing about it is, is that we all know we all have disagreements. But then what makes the difference between both of these sets of families or couples? Essentially, it is the way they communicate with one another. So you know now where I'm going. I want to talk a little bit about communication. Because not only is communication the key to relationships in our families, but if used correctly, they're keys to our relationships within our workplaces, within our churches, within our schools, and everywhere else that we have to relate with one another. Because we are all individual people. And because we're all individual people, we're all going to have different points of views. But the question is, is that how do we deal with them when they come across? And I believe that there are godly ways in which we can do this. So it's up on the screen now, and I want to look at basically three essentials of effective communication. Three essentials of effective communication. 
Now we have this couple, this couple up here, Alice and Bernard. Now there's no couple here called Alice and Bernard, so I'm, I'm not basing this on anyone here. This is just a, a scenario. Alice and Bernard, they have a problem. This week, Alice has been home and she's prepared the food, the house is clean, but she needs to go and do some other chores, her own personal business. So it's five o'clock and she's looking at her watch and Bernard's not home. So she starts to get a little frustrated because she says in his, her mind, I spoke to Bernard and I told him how it was important that he be home because I need to do things. He's not home. So she waits a little bit longer. Six o'clock. Still not home. She calls him on the phone to find out where he is and there's no response. So she's getting frustrated now. Seven o'clock. He's not home. By now, what she has to do can no longer take place. So she is now very, very upset. Eight o'clock. The kids are now asleep, they're in bed. 8.30, Bernard puts the key in, unlocks the door, and slowly comes out, meeting Alice in the doorway. What does she do? It's very in interesting that clearly there is a problem. Clearly that situation is brewing for an argument to take place. But what happens? Well, here is the thing. There is this problem and it needs a prescription. Just like when you go to the doctor and there is an issue that's taking place, you need some sort of solution. But before you can get to the solution, what do you need? You need diagnosis. So you need to work through what the issues actually are. And the, the key between a couple that is considered successful and a couple that is not considered successful is the process that they go through when they are trying to work out the diagnosis. Now, now, now here is the, the, the thing. Communication, if I go back quickly... It has disappeared. There we go. Oh, it just disappeared. Anyway, communication is the best way to get to this, this diagnosis. But there are three problems, three ways that they could deal with it. As Bernard walks through the door, three things can happen. Alice can... Watch him, give him a very disapproving look, like, you know how it goes, something like that, or, or, or just fume, and then walk off. So there's no talking. That's option number one. Option number two, she can blast off. So as soon as he walks through the door, it's, where have you been? Have you, didn't you know, that I told you, I spoke to you, how many times do I need to speak to you? Are you silly? Do you not hear? Is there something wrong with you? That's blasting off. Or she can do wise talk. Now what is wise talk? Well, this is something that I want us to, 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 to look into today. But before we do that, there's a first, first principle that you need to know before effectively communicating with anybody. When you are at your peak of your anger, communication is all but impossible. Let me say that again. When you are at the peak of your anger, communication is all but impossible. It is... What, what happens is that when you're so angry, your brain takes over and your emotions start to control you. And so having a rational conversation is just not going to happen. 
So this, so this is this is the point. What do we do at that situation? Well, the first thing that we need to do is realize when when are you actually getting angry? Do we know? Does anyone here know they can pinpoint the points when they are actually starting to get real now, I'm not just talking normal anger, I'm just talking real rage. Does anyone know within themselves? Yeah, some people know. Can can I hear just a few? What 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 gets what 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 happens to you when you know that you're getting angry? What what happens? Okay, you start to raise your voice, yeah? Heartbeat. So you can feel it. You can feel the the the, bud, the, the heart start to beat a little bit faster, yeah? Any anything else? Pacing up and down. okay, pacing up and down. So you start to get quite vigorous in your movements, yeah? Break. <laughs> I think you've reached the point of anger if you're breaking, <laughs> you're breaking plates. <laughs> okay, you start to speak faster, yeah, Brother Brown? Your improper circulation. Tell me a bit more about that. What's improper circulation? Right, okay. Okay, excellent, excellent. For us, is, there are certain things individually that starts to happen to us when we start getting angry. So for me, for me, what starts to happen is that I can feel, I can literally feel my heartbeat starting to get faster. I also tense up. So if you see me standing very, very still, something is not right. <laughs> And I also feel this rush of blood go into my head. Those are the warning signs that tell me that I'm reaching a point of anger within myself. Now the thing about it, that does not show physically on me. So I can be looking as calm as I am now, but inside I am filling up with rage. At that point is when I need to know that I'm getting very angry. So when I feel that, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm reaching the point now when I'm getting really angry. We all need to know what our own individual reactions are to anger. If we know that, then we're able to manage it. The best thing that you can do at that time is to be honest with the person who you are angry with at that stage and say, at, at this point, look, I want to have this conversation, but right now, I'm just really angry. And I want to have it, but I want to have a proper conversation. So let's take a time out. Okay, let's just take a break. And what you then do is you go and you cool off. Now understand what I'm saying here, cool off. You don't go thinking bad things about the person. So you don't say, take a break and say, I can't believe that person. How dare they do this to me? All that does is prolongs the anger that is within you. What you want to do is you want to, to your body to clear itself of all the adrenaline that's building up, all of the, 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 heart, the fast heartbeat, you want it to slow down, you want to yourself to be calm. That does not necessarily mean you're, you're not still hurt or upset about what has ever happened, but you're in a better place to have a proper conversation about the situation that's upsetting you. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So the first thing here Alice needs to know is, is she getting upset? Well, she, she, may, she may seem that it's, it's, it's overcoming her. She, her. Her cheeks may start to flush red. She may ten, clench her, her jaws and her fists. If that's the case, she needs to say, Bernard, right now I'm, I'm, I'm really upset. But I, I can't talk because I want to have a proper conversation. Can we talk at so-and-so time? You need to specify when you're going to talk. If you leave it, then the chances are it's not going to materialize into a conversation. And all, and all that becomes is an avoidance tactic, not to deal with the problem. And then it will happen again. And you would get angry again to the point when you don't feel like you want to walk away, but you just want to blast off. And that's what we don't want to happen. So once Alice has calmed down, 
She needs to look at essential number one, which is speak wisely. How do we speak wisely? Because what's most important is that the problem needs to get addressed. And we need to find the best way in which we can address this problem. So how does she, she go about it? Well, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 6 says, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer one another. How often does that happen? <laughs> Let me say it again. Let your speech always be with grace. Understand that first point. Grace is something that we must always give because we recognize that we could be in the situation that the person you're angry with is in right now. Do you understand what I mean? You could have been the person that got somebody else upset. And so recognizing our, our flaws and our, our own individualities allow us to approach one another with grace. That doesn't mean that the problem doesn't get addressed, but you are dealing with a person who's just like you, flawed, may have made mistakes, may have, have, have hurt somebody but, but didn't mean to, or, or maybe they did, but still, let's do it with grace. Seasoned with salt. Now... I, I don't know, but sometimes when I first, I, there was a time when I used to, 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 to cook with salt and a time when I, I stopped completely. The first time I had food without salt, it tasted bitter. I, I just couldn't imagine how people cooked without salt. Eventually, with the cooking purposes, I, I, I cut down and, and got used to it. But you can see what that means. Seasoned with salt allows you to have the, the impact or the, the, the force that you want it to have without it turning bitter or sour. And it goes on, that you may know how, to, how you ought to answer each 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 one or answer one another so the first step to speaking wisely is that Alice should identify a specific problem now the problem has to be specific and the problem cannot be aimed at the character of the person you're talking about so Alice what she shouldn't do is say you are always late what that does is you're attributing a character flaw to the person. And nobody likes that. No, nobody likes to, to be criticized in such a way. It, all that does is make the other person get their back up and say, hey, wait a minute, but you, you're always on my back about this, that, and the other. So you need to identify a specific problem. In this case, Bernard is working late. So what could she say? Well, she could say, Bernard, I have a problem with your work schedule. So she's not saying she has a problem with Bernard. She's not attributing anything to his character, but she's attributing the problem to his work schedule because him coming home late every day is causing a problem with her schedule. Okay? The second step is that she needs to express her true feelings. So, so she says the problem, but then she expresses how this affects her. So if you notice what she's doing, she's focusing all her attentions on herself. She could say, for example, I'm upset. I'm angry. I'm disappointed. I feel like a widow. This lets her know that the work schedule that is, that is being created makes her feel this way. And so what it does, it doesn't attribute 
any blame as such to the character of the person, but lets that person know what this current situation is doing and affecting and how it is affecting her. Bernard, I have a problem with your work schedule. Whenever you, you, whenever you come home late, or whenever you're home late, I feel very upset and like a widow because I don't feel that I have a husband who supports me. I feel that I have to do all the, the, the chores by myself. I have to take care of the children by myself. And I don't have the time to do my own personal chores. I feel angry. So the focus is on my own feelings, not what the other person is doing so much, but my own feelings. And this is something Jesus himself did. Jesus wasn't someone who was afraid to let others know how he was feeling. Because in doing that, it gives the other person an insight into your inner psyche and what is happening. And it allows them to empathize with you. The other step, step number three, Alice should clearly state what she wants. So she identifies a problem. She has a problem with Bernard's work schedule. It makes her feel upset, disappointed, angry, and f makes her feel like a widow. But what does she want? Well, she, she may want some sort of compromise or some sort of, uh, of change in the system that would allow her to do what she needs to do when the evening time comes. Jesus also did this. When he said his soul was exceedingly sorrowful even unto death, he stated what he wanted. He said, stay here and watch with me. This is the same principles that Jesus is using. <coughs> and again, when she's stating what she wants, she needs to keep using the I statements. As we've seen, I am upset. I am hurt. I am disappointed. N not you statements. You're always late. You don't care about me. You always do this to me. Do you see the difference? When you focus on the other person's character and def 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 defects and flaws, all it ever does is make them feel worse about themselves. But rather, if you focus on your own, own situation and how this situation is affecting you, it allows your spouse to feel that, oh, I need to find a way to support you in this situation. It changes the way things are going. See, you statements, blame you for my feelings. Pointing the finger at you, what that does promotes war. I statements, on the other hand, says how I feel, points the finger at me, and promotes peace. And that's where we want to be. <coughs> Effective I statement states the problem, it tells how you feel, and it also says what I want. It all starts with I. So, what could Alice do? She could say, I'm very upset, waiting day after day, because I need the car to do shopping. So do you, do you see what she did here? She stated, she stated the problem, but she also stated how it feels and how it is affecting her. I am very upset. I'm waiting day after day because I need the car to do shopping. The second essential. So there is a way to speak wisely, but there's also a need to listen actively. <laughs> James 1 verse 19 says, Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Very often, though, we, we, we read this in opposites, don't we? <laughs> we're, 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 <laughs> we're slow to listen, quick to speak, and quick to become angry. But if we listen to James, he's saying, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. In doing so, we find better ways of creating peace. What Bernard should do is follow those principles. There is a problem. So he should be quick to listen. 
What does that mean? Not interrupt her when she's speaking. So she's saying, I'm upset. So why are you upset? I'm coming home. I'm putting food on the table. What's the matter with you? Every day is problem, problem, problem. He hasn't even heard what she has to say yet. He's interrupting her. If he is quick to listen, he would hear everything that she has to say. I'm upset because day after the day, I don't get to do the shopping or the chores or whatever it may be. But then when he listens, he's in a better place to do step number five, which is interpret Alice's feelings. What he does here, when you interpret Alice's feelings, we realize that it's everything that we're taking into account. When we interpret someone's communication, 7% of what we are actually interpreting comes from the words we speak. It's more to do with body language and tone of voice and all of the main nonverbal avenues of communication. It's not even the words. Two people can say exactly the same words and have two very different responses purely by body language and tone of voice. This is why when, we're, when we recognize the fundamental principle that nothing can be achieved once we're enraged and angry. We, we cannot have that conversation. Once we're in a better place, we can do. Effective or active listening hears what is said plus what's not said. It combines words, tone, body language to interpret feelings and grasps the total message. Luke chapter 5 verse 8 says, Peter's words were, depart from me. But his tone and his body language said, stay with me. It was very, very different. Bernard needs to empathize with Alice. So in order for him to do this, he cannot feel like he's being attacked. If he's feeling attacked, he's not going to want to empathize with you. He's going to want to counterattack. And that just leads to, what do we say, war. So if you speak wisely, then Bernard has the best opportunity to listen actively and give him the ability to empathize. How do we empathize? Well, well first, actually, let's look at what empathy is. It is to put myself in the place and in your place and try to experience what you're feeling. It's a, an act of trying to view life from the other person's eyes. It's not saying that I have been through your situation and I know that's what you're going through. That's sympathy. Empathy is trying to place yourselves in the shoes of the other person and view life from their perspective. And that's what Bernard needs to do. He has come home and he needs to view life. What is it like to be Alice? who has to look after the kids, clean the house, and wants to be able to do little things for herself, but is unable to because she cannot get the car to do so. What is life like for her? Those are the questions Bernard needs to be asking himself. Step seven is Bernard also should mirror Alice's feelings. Mirroring is restating the speaker's feelings. It tells me that you understand how I'm feeling and what I need. Now this is interesting because it seems kind of strange to do this, yet it is a powerful thing to do. So for example, if Alice says, I'm feeling really upset because I, I feel like I don't have the opportunity to do the stuff I need to do because I don't have the car. Mirroring is a way to help empathize. It's just restating what she has just said using new language. I see that you're really upset because you feel that I'm, I'm, I'm not home in time and you don't get the car to do what you need to do. And that, that, that puts an extra burden on you. It's just restating exactly the same thing she says. But what it does, it lets Alice know that he is listening to her and he understands where she's coming from. And what that does, it disarms her. 
because she feels right. I'm having a conversation and he really gets me. He gets what I'm saying. And it leads to the next point, which will be the, the resolution. But let's go on. <clears throat> so yes, yeah, so just like I said before, using you statements. So you feel hurt because I kept the car each week. God mirrored the Jonah's feelings when he stated, is it, right for, is it right for you to be angry? So he's trying to empathize with him. So let's look at this for a second. We've got the first couple, the speaker, what the speaker does. It first deals with the, the feelings, the problems, the feelings, the wants, and all of that is done by using I statements. Do we see that? So let's look at that. The problem, feelings, and wants. Those are the three main things that you need to do as a speaker, and you use that using I statements. Now, when you're doing active listening, you want to be interpreting what they're saying, empathizing, and mirroring what they say, and you do that by using you statements. So, here's what I want. If I can get two volunteers to help me practice this so we can see how it works, who's brave enough to come up? You're brave enough? You can come up if you wish. Anyone else? One more person. They say a little child should lead them. Karis, okay, okay. So let's do this now. Who wants to have the problem? <laughs> okay, come here. You've got, the, you've got an issue, okay? Basically, basically you feel Karis is not sharing her favorite toy with you enough, okay? So what I want you to do first is state the problem, but focus on you. So focus, what, what would you say with that situation? I'm so angry, I'm feeling worried mm -hmm. that, that, you, that you went, went away. Okay, so you're, you're, you're feeling angry, did you say? And you were worried because Karis went away. Okay, so what you're going to do now is you're going to interpret and empathize just by using you statements and restating everything that she said. Uh, you said that I went away too long. Mm -hmm. And how did she feel? She, she felt worried. And? Um, angry. Right, okay. So do you see how that worked? Yeah. So the, there was the issue. She said how she felt, but it focused on her. And then what Karis did, she just restated everything that she said. But here's the thing, there is a, there's also a, a reason maybe why Karis went away. So focusing on you, using I statements, why did you go away? Because I wanted to go to Asa. You wanted to go to Asa? Okay. And what was so necessary that you needed to go to Asda? I needed sweet potatoes. You needed sweet potatoes. That's excellent. So, so Kara said, saying that she, she went to Asda because she needed sweet potatoes. So what then happens is that you restate by interpreting and empathizing, and just restate everything that she said using you language, saying, so I see you did... Go on. What did um, she say? She said, um, I went to Asda and I, I buy sweet potatoes. Okay. So do you see what happens here? 
Walia is angry and worried because Karis has gone away. But Karis needed to go because she needed sweet potatoes. So do you see the two issues here? There's no problem with Karis going to get sweet potatoes. She's just worried because probably she didn't know where she was. And so what they could then do is bargain and say, well, if you go somewhere, perhaps let me know where you're going first so I don't get worried and upset. And then Karis can go and get the sweet potatoes that she needs for lunch. Hope you're providing for all of us. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> That is generally how, how the wheel of, of speaker and listener works. It's a, it's a graceful exchange between the two in order to come to an amicable resolution that gives both parties what they want. So as, as stated before, it's just like a coin or a bill. So there's two sides to every story. So just with Alice and Bernard, maybe there's a reason why Bernard was coming home late, yeah? And so he also then needs to explain his reasons why he's been coming home late. This is where we come into exchanging gracefully. So he then switches from being the listener to the speaker, but he also has to speak wisely. And then Alice also then has to listen actively. And if they exchange gracefully between the, the, the two, they both can be able to pinpoint what the problems are and find solutions to that problem. So Philippians 2 verse 4 says, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also the interests of others. This is what it means to be in relationship with one another. It's putting others before you and understanding where the other person is coming from. So step nine, Alice and Bernard should exchange gracefully. So now that Bernard is the speaker, he may say something like this. Our company is downsizing and many are losing their jobs. Each afternoon this week, when I am ready to leave, my supervisor gives me a new assignment marked urgent. I stay on to finish it and to keep my, in order to keep my job. So now that Alice is the listener, she uses you statements. So what she could say is, what could she say? Before she gets to that, that part, remember, Bernard is now speaking wisely. Yeah, okay, so you're... So, okay, but before we reach that point, so I, I, I like what Lorna said. You're basically, what you're saying to me, Bernard, is you're facing a lot of stress at work. The reason why you're coming home late is because the boss keeps putting work on your shoulders and you're, in order to make sure that you keep your job, because remember, they're downsizing, people are getting made redundant, you're doing the work in order to, to save your job. She is restating what he is saying. So now we have the two, the two sides of the coin. We can see Alice is feeling stressed and burdened at home because Bernard is coming home late, while we also see Bernard is under a lot of stress and pressure at work because he feels that his job is at threat, and so he needs to stay at work. Those are the two issues which allows them to bargain, come to an arrangement. So, so we've, heard, we've heard a couple solutions. What could they both do that would help both of their problems? What could, what could? Why not? Okay, so that's a solution. So if you need the car, maybe you can take him to work or, and pick him up as well, and, and then you can do, do whatever you need to do. That's a solution. It's a win-win for both. He is able to stay in order for him to do what he needs to do, and then you can take the car and go. What, what other solutions could there be? 
go run a bar for him and when he gets okay. So you're, you're trying to, to help support him in his situation. Good, good, good. That, that's, a, that's a solution. What else? Online shopping. Online shopping. <laughs> <laughs> of course, why not? <laughs> Online shopping. Yes, yes. Okay, if the situation allows, maybe that's a possibility, go with him. But she still needs to do her, her chores as well. Her right, okay, so keep everyone informed. So, so keep it updated, ring, call in order to, to, to sort the solution. So do you see what happens here? By speaking wisely, listening actively, you both pinpoint the problems that is causing this friction and you're able to, to make solutions based on that. And so it becomes a win-win for both of you. So moving on, that's step 10. They bargain together. Yeah, that's it. When each understands the other's point of view, we are ready to explore a solution together to create a win-win plan where each loses a little and each wins a lot. And that's where you want to be. So bargaining, in order to do that, you need to list all the options, decide on the best one, and then let that be the win-win solution for both of you. Let's move on. And the thing about it is, is just as a healthy marital relationship requires constant communication between husband and wife, a successful spiritual relationship needs communication between myself and God using the three essentials. Speaking wisely, listening actively, and come into a solution, a bargaining part. So the essential number one with God is talk to God. Matthew chapter 6 says, When you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father. Spiritual communication is just as important as a marital communication. And if we are to maintain healthy marriages, healthy relationships, prayer is key. I can't even stress that enough. Do you know, we know that the, the, the divorce statistics are one in two, right? Roughly. It's about one in two. Out of those who do not get divorced, Do you know what the, the, the percentages, percentages are? Wait, let, no, sorry, let, I said that wrong. Out of all relationships, do we know what the percentages are of people who pray in their relationships? And when I say pray, I don't mean just a, a quick, um, bless us, Lord, for this day. I mean a deep, intimate prayer with our spouses, with our partners. The kind of prayer David prayed to God when he said, search me, O God, and if there's anything within me, remove it. That sort of vulnerable prayer. Do you know what the, the, the statistics are? One in ten. So a very, very small percentage of, of, of couples pray together like that. Do you know, if you take those, those couples who do pray together like that, do you know what the, the statistics are for them who get divorced? One in 1,000. So when you look at the overall statistics of the, of the world, one in two people get divorced. But couples who pray intimately together, the divorce statistics go skyrocket, so, sorry, go down very low. One in 1,000. Communication with God is so key that sometimes we, 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 we overlook it. But it is necessary. Because he is the glue that holds everything together. Amen. And speaking wisely, active listeningly, if, works, if you do that with God, we can do it 
within our relationships. And I pray that this will be something that we can, just a little something we can take within ourselves in order to, to build better relationships. And like I said, this is not something that we can just use, need to use just for our families. If we use it in our everyday lives, in dealing with other people, in our workplaces, schools, friendships, everything, we find that we are able to maintain and sustain healthy relationships for a lot longer. So I pray that God will continue to be with us and allow us to speak wisely, listen actively, and allow us to work closely with God. Amen. Amen.